Welcome to the Influential Motherhood Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Duncan, and my dream is to inspire moms to pursue their goals and help them make a difference in their world. I'm a mom of two young boys, a wife to my high school sweetheart, and a lawyer. This show is a place to hear stories of moms working hard to have a positive influence in their profession or their community, and sometimes both, even as they juggle their responsibilities at work, at home, and to their children. You'll get tangible, practical tips for managing the chaotic world of motherhood and work. Come along as we hear these stories and feel inspired to step outside of our comfort zone as leaders and as a positive force within our communities. I believe that moms can change the world. I am here with Zakia Miller. We were both cheerleaders. Um, Zakia is a couple years older, so um, was always one of the girls that I looked up to <laughs> on um, on the cheerleading team. And um, I remember doing the Zakia dance. Zakia, I don't know if you remember that, but what? Um, yeah, well, we'll have to talk about that. But okay. um, <laughs> you were you're famous for your dance, so um, <laughs> I'm so excited to do this podcast and um, to talk about the work that you've started doing now um here we are what 17 years later um yeah. talking on a podcast and you are a um, wellness advocate for moms and um, talk about clean beauty and clean eating and mindfulness which is also important especially for busy moms so um, and you're a mom yourself so thanks for being here I'm excited to have you Thanks for having me. Thank yeah, you so much. That was yeah. A introduction as well. So take us back, um, and I gave kind of an, a brief introduction, but tell us a little bit more about you and um, fill in some gaps for us about your journey to motherhood, and then also your journey to becoming interested in health and clean beauty, and maybe tell us a little bit more about what you do since you do, um, I think, some consulting in this area. So, okay, so give you a quick background. Uh, I moved to New York right after college. Um, I actually met my husband my rising senior year. Um, he was from Jersey. Mm -hmm. And I moved here after I graduated, started working in the entertainment industry, mostly publishing. So I started my first job out was in Style Magazine. And I was doing marketing events, promotions for them. Mm -hmm. And then that quickly moved into teen people. Um, and then I ended up actually freelancing full time after that and kind of was able to go around to all of the major major publishing houses mm -hmm. in New York, Condé Nast, um, Hearst, Time Inc. Anyway, wow. so um, I did that for a long time. And then in 2009, I actually started going into the nonprofit world. I really liked what I was doing in the yeah. entertainment industry, but I didn't like that I couldn't see a bottom line of who I was actually helping. Yeah, I was basically helping multi-billion dollar companies just make more money by helping with their advertising and right. marketing. And I really wanted to do something more. So I started going into the nonprofit sector and I worked for one nonprofit that we had the opportunity to send uh, disadvantaged girls to college. Okay. And that was the first time I was able to take my expertise in events and marketing and put it and apply it to somewhere that I could actually see the bottom line and I could actually see the people that were bene benefiting from yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and then 2010 rolls around, I find out that I am pregnant and my pregnancies are really difficult and tough. Okay. I was with my first daughter, I was actually sick for five, the first five months. Oh my goodness. Like could not eat, couldn't keep anything oh down. Oh my goodness. It was so bad that even like food commercials on TV would make me sick. Oh my goodness. That's terrible. I didn't realize how many food commercials we have on TV. Yeah. And so you can't watch them. And I was like, oh my gosh, we're such a gluttonous country. All we do is eat. Just one eat, after right? another. Right. It, it, it literally. And I was like, I could not take it. But anyway, so I ended up I decided to stop working and I decided to stay home with my daughter full time. Mm -hmm. uh, two years later, we have another go round. We have another daughter and I'm still at home and I'm kind of freelancing for some of the contacts that I had worked for previously. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I was at home with them and I, and I told myself I was going to give them the first three years, which are, you know, the most important in their development. Yeah. And I ended up going even further than that. It hasn't been until recently in the last 
two, two to three years, my children now are seven and five, that I have really started to reacclimate myself into the workforce. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that has I, felt I, like a good time. I mean, it's felt like a kind of natural transition for you. I will, you know, as the kids got older, when my youngest went into kindergarten last year, I was like, okay, my time is really going to free up because now she really is in school all day. Yeah, yeah. And what am I going to do? Because my youngest is starting kindergarten this this coming fall and I knew I was going to need something. And, you know, I didn't want to feel like, well, not because I didn't want to, but I guess in the last few years, I was also feeling like I was getting lost in just motherhood. And I was mm-hmm. like, I have so much more to offer than to just be a mother. Even though I love being a mother and I try to be the best that I can, there are still other gifts that I have um, that I really should be using. Yeah. So that's just kind of how it it, it started. It started, the the whole idea of clean eating and uh, preventative health started as a challenge for myself. My girlfriend actually asked me um, to do a 15-day vegan challenge. And I said, no way. Yeah. It was three years ago. And I was like, nope, no way. Not interested. Don't want to do it. So she was like, come on, just. Oh, sorry to interrupt. I was just going to ask, at that point in time, were you following any sort of limitations on like what you ate or, okay. So it was just. I was eating everything with the the exception of pork, but everything other than that I was eating. And. So I was just like, I don't, I don't feel the need to, don't really want to. And she just was like, she kept persuading me. I was like, okay, fine. 15 days. Mm -hmm. And I documented it more so just for myself because I thought it would be fun. But then I started putting it on Snapchat. I'm not on Snapchat anymore, but at that point I was, and I noticed that people were interested and wanted to see what I was eating. And I realized one it was a lot easier than I imagined. It was mm-hmm. also fun, but it was also enjoyable. Like I really enjoyed the food. Um, so I, after like maybe the, after like 12 days or so, I didn't realize how good I felt because I had been living with, you know, chronic nausea, which yeah. no one could ever diagnose for me. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, that bloating and that indigestion and all that, I just thought that was just part of life. If you ate, you had that at the end of the day and that's Mm -hmm. what it was. Yeah. And it wasn't until I changed my diet that I realized I did not have to live with these symptoms. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so even still after the 15 days, I went back and started eating everything again, even though I knew how good I felt, I had more energy, more clarity, um, but I wasn't ready. So it still took me probably another six, seven months to get serious about it. Mm -hmm. And then I was like full on, all right, I'm going to do this. Fruits and vegetables, I can do this. And since then, so it's been like a good like three years now that I am uh, consistently on a meatless diet. Now, I do have days where I might indulge or have something. Um, I do have seafood every once in a while, maybe like once a month I'll have seafood. Mm -hmm. So it's not, sh- I'm not a strict vegan. I, th- I call myself vegan-ish. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's working for me. And and um, it's kind of how this platform has started to create on Instagram, just based on the things that I've eaten and the things that I've learned. That's amazing. So I guess one question I always have for folks who are following the, um, a, a mostly vegan you know, lifestyle and diet. And I I don't mean diet as in like fad diet, but just, you know, what their, their menu, so to speak, is the question around protein. Um, Because I, I have found that when I'm in a period of my life where I'm great about working out a lot, I have to have protein to not feel like I'm, you know, shaky and kind of like, don't really have the levels of energy that I feel like I need. So how do you fill in those gaps um, where you might get that, you know, that kind of extra oomph from some protein without eating meat? So I I think it's a huge misconception that it is difficult to find your protein Mm -hmm. without meat, just because there are so many other alternatives. Um, You have anything from quinoa and lentils, almonds, satan, chickpeas, tofu, peas, I don't know, edamame, 
um, I mean, even spinach, peanut butter, yeah. hemp, uh, artichokes. There's so many uh, sprouted bread can give you protein. Um, eggs. I still keep eggs in my diet as well. Um, black beans, buckwheat. Oh, th- there's so many other ways to get your protein. Yeah. And I've done a lot of uh, research too on athletes. Mm -hmm. who have excelled once they have changed their diet to a plant-based diet and that there's a misconception that you can't build muscle or you can't build strength without this protein. Um, And his name escapes me at this, at the moment, but he is a world, uh, he's a world champion and like lifting and he's a completely plant-based. I'm going to have to figure out his name for you, but yeah, yeah, we can figure uh, it out and put it like in the show notes. So then people can find it. But yes, there's a lot of evidence uh, to show that a lot of athletes um, have, have, can really thrive on a plant-based diet um, and getting alternative sources of protein. That's awesome. Okay. Well, that makes me feel better. (laughs) Yes. So, so, as it sounds like you're, you've been kind of self-taught in a lot of ways in this area. What has been the most surprising thing that you've learned about food and how our food impacts our health? So I actually did a um, course on eCornell. It was a plant-based certification program. Oh, okay. Yeah. And what I was mostly floored when I originally took the course, I thought it was just going to explain the benefits of being plant-based. Mm-hmm. That's what I was fully expecting. But what I did not realize that it really was showing the effects of meat and dairy in, in a lot of cases on the most common diseases in our country. And wow. that's diabetes, heart disease, um, hypertension, stroke. A lot of these things are all related to the foods that we're eating. Mm -hmm. And the study was going on to show even, I'm sorry, in cancer as well. A lot of the studies went on to show that, that people diagnosed with these diseases that went to a plant-based diet most often could completely correct their symptoms based on just the food that they were eating. That's amazing. So that's what I was mostly floored by that like, the food that we are eating is slowly like killing ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we have, you know, we have the FDA that has approved a lot of things that in other countries are no longer approved for consumption. Yeah. And they're known carcinogens and, but we continue to allow them in our foods. Yeah. And what the scariest part as a mom is that most of these things are in foods marketed toward children. Right. And that's the part that really, as far as like motherhood and really trying to change the way my children eat, Mm -hmm. um, because I did not, I, they're, they're not vegan. They're not even vegan-ish. One of mine, my seven-year-old sometimes says that she's vegetarian. My five-year-old loves her meat. Mm -hmm. So that, that's something that we're working on, but you know, she's doing more seafoods now, but even changing the snacks could be, could, 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 could dramatically reduce our risk for you know, exposing them to toxins and carcinogens. That's so scary. It is. Yeah. So, you know, I think that, I I mean, I know I experienced this as a mom. I have one kid who loves his fruits and vegetables. And when he asks for a snack, if you put a bowl of cantaloupe in front of him, it's like you've just handed him a bowl of chocolate. Like he loves Mm -hmm. it. And then my other is a meat and potatoes <laughs> kind of kid, you know, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. meat, potatoes, and carbs. And right. um, he literally like shakes from the inside out if he bites into a strawberry. Um, how, what is this, what, what do you feel like are kind of the top tips or tricks that you found to guide your children towards healthier eating um, when kids can be picky, you know, and right. Right. Um, you don't want to, force your kids, so to speak. Um, but we're trying to train them towards this kind of healthy lifestyle. So my first, my first tip and trick really is to start young. Yeah. Because I think we all know as babies, like there's very few things that babies turn away and they will eat pretty much anything. But at the same time that you're feeding them things, you're also teaching their taste buds what they will like and what they're willing to take in. So the more that you like expose them to foods that you're going to want them to eat as they grow up, you're having a better chance already. 
So first thing is make sure they have a variety of foods. And I know obviously when they're young and you have to start testing foods because of allergies, obviously you should follow your physician's right. um, you know, guidelines for that. But once you know that your child is not allergic to something, just you have to expose them. Yeah. And the second biggest thing is what are you eating? Because that is where they get their clues from. Yeah. They always are going to come over to see what you're eating and take from your bowl or take from your plate. And I've realized this. As I've changed my snack foods, my kids have also changed theirs. So okay, I have a crazy addiction to celery. It's, I don't, I don't, not celery juice. And I know that's like all the rage right now, yeah. <laughs> but like just straight celery. I love the crunch. And it also, it kind of substitutes like the chip, that crunch that you need yeah. without all the salt and all the other calories. But I have, so I have to eat celery every day. But now I realize my kids who never like celery now will eat celery. That's awesome. Even my like youngest who like loves her meat will take it with hummus. She'll be like, I don't really like it, but if you give me some hummus, I'll eat it. <laughs> So I think it's very important to think about what you're eating because you're setting the example. And lastly, someone actually gave me this tip. She was a chef and her son ate every vegetable, did not complain. The color green did not bother him. And I said, how did you do it? And she said, the best thing that you can do is turn all of their snacks green. And I was like, how in the world are their snacks going to be green? Like nobody has green snacks. But once someone, she told me that and you start looking, you actually can find a lot of things that they will like that are actually green. So I gave my kids, especially my younger one who is like, has an aversion to the color green. Yeah. <laughs> tons of green snacks from like the pirate's booty, like the spinach one yep. is green. The, um, the little snap pea, like snow pea, like chips, those edamame, green grapes, everything they ate was green. Just so that they did not have an aversion to the color. That is so smart. I love that. I love that. When my youngest, the one who, you know, has an aversion to fruits and vegetables, (laughs) (laughs) um, when he was kind of old enough to communicate, you know, that the word no, that he didn't want something, I would offer him an apple and a fresh apple he did not want. But I would, so he would ask for crackers So I became smart and started buying dried apples and Mm. was call I would call them crackers because you know they had the same texture. Right. And I would say, Oh, you Mm -hmm. want crackers? Sure, you know, here here's some crackers. And I would put them in a bowl for him and he would eat them not knowing that they were apples and not crackers. And um he eventually kind of caught on. And now if I throw some peanut butter with him, um, then he'll eat it. But I I felt so, I felt like I had won the parenting, you know, like lottery when I figured that out. I was like, I've I've done it. I've figured out a way to get my child to eat apples and he doesn't even know it. (laughs) Um, I mean, you got to take what you can get. Yeah, exactly. Some of it is like, you know, like, you know, not playing a game with them, but just kind of like having to trick them, especially when they're already older yeah, and they already yeah. have these aversions and different ways that you can like change yeah, uh, the food that they eat and the foods they want. Yeah. I love that. So um, let's talk about um, clean beauty. And okay. I think that's also part of, um, that's also part of the work that you do. And what do you feel like women are missing when it comes to information about their beauty products? Um, well, the same thing it's, you know, I, I I don't like to harp on the FDA, but I do because Mm -hmm. again, they are still approving certain ingredients to be in our beauty products that again, overseas have been banned. Yeah. Parabens, preservatives, all these things, the dyes and the fragrances that we know are harmful to us. We still allow in our products and, it's astounding up to, I think it's up to like 70% of the, the products that you put on your skin are actually absorbed. Wow. And so when you think about like, well, what am I actually putting on my skin? What am I putting on my child's skin? Um, and if these products are being absorbed, you know, what risk am I putting them? Am, you know, am I exposing them to? Yeah. And it's something that I think people are starting to get with all of these like brands like um, 
Beauty Counter and a lot of wellness and clean brands that are now popping up. Mm-hmm. Uh, brands from overseas that are now trying to populate the U.S. Yeah, because people I think are finally paying attention to it. Right. Um, but I, you know, I we can't take labels for face value anymore because again, the FDA will allow you to say something is natural when it's not actually natural. Right. Like that, they, it means nothing anymore, and you really have to do your due diligence and read the labels. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, as I was thinking about this conversation that we were going to have, one of the things that I feel like there's now a misconception about is that being clean, whether it's your food or your beauty products, also means being expensive. So as moms are listening and thinking, you know, okay, this is great, but I'm on a really tight budget. And I, you know, I, I, I'm by the, I have, I feel like I have to stick within this beauty budget or, and, or within this, um, food budget. What, what are your tips and tricks for moms who, um, have that misconception about not being able to change these parts of their lifestyle because of cost? I totally get it. And I think it's a huge misconception because you have brands like Whole Foods where everyone knows you go in Whole Foods and it's, you know, nicknamed Whole Check whole check right. because it's expensive. <laughs> yeah. Um, but when you have uh, brands like Trader Joe's yep. and even Aldi, you can actually find a lot of foods and products that are clean ingredients that are budget friendly. Mm-hmm. And I, um, so I have a, a, I don't particularly love Walmart. And I know this is like, the biggest, the biggest retailer in the world and like how, you know, <laughs> blasphemy for you to say anything terrible about Walmart. But recently I went back into a Walmart for the first time in a long time. Mm-hmm. And I was actually pleasantly surprised at some of the products that I found on the shelves. They had, so this was like a super Walmart. So they had a full on grocery store. Yeah. And so I literally just walked the aisles to see what I could find. If I had to shop out of here, what I could find. And there are actually a lot of products that I would be willing to eat myself and feed my family. Oh, that's good. So I, I definitely think now as the people are becoming more aware of what we're eating and the products that we're using, that companies and retailers have to respond. Yeah. So yeah. I think you can get it on every budget level. Um, and so don't don't let that be a reason you think you can't do it. You yeah, just have to, it good. might take a little bit more time in the grocery store to actually go through and read the labels and figure out what's right for your family or what's good for your family. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's worth it in the end. Yeah. Hey friends, popping into this fun episode to remind you to take a quick second to subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. And don't forget, you can also sign up for bonus episodes and content from my monthly newsletter at melissaduncan.com slash join. Thanks for listening and let's get back to the show. So I I know that one of the other things that you focus your work on and and um, I think probably the consulting that you do is on mindfulness. And I, I feel like, so I work in higher ed and that's something that we talk a lot about and with, especially with stressed out law school students, you know, mm-hmm. thinking about mindfulness and wellness. Um, but not everyone out there who's listening would be familiar with that term. So um, for a busy mom who is, you know, in the chaos of where we are, you know, where we all are right now as far as motherhood and jobs and budgets and all of those things, um, what would you say would be a, a not like a, a non-scary introduction to mindfulness, um, and how to learn more about it for someone who's never had any experience with it? Um, okay. I, I could, I can see how, like you say, mindfulness people are like, oh my gosh, I can't meditate for an hour. I can't quiet my mind. Right. I'm too minutes. busy to, to sit. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I think, but I think the reason it's so important is it allows you to kind of control your day yeah, and to control your mindset and your reaction to things. And the more that you become mindful, which is really, for me, it means to go inside mm-hmm. and it's to really listen to myself and listen to my own voice so that the voices of those outside can influence me negatively. Yeah. And, you know, 
you have that person who has cut you off or who's upset with you and like in the morning, rush hour, on your way to work, somebody cuts you off, you're upset and it almost can set the tone for the rest of your day. Like one thing adds to another. And in that moment, it is being mindful of, okay, maybe they're in a rush. Who knows what's going on with them, but I am not going to allow that one action to influence the rest of my day. Right. And some things that I have done that I really love doing, I really love vision boards because Mm -hmm. I just think it gives you a visual of what you're trying to do and where you're trying to go. Because I think it's important, especially for busy moms, to have goals. Because I think a lot of times, often, we get wrapped up in our children or our career or both, and we forget about ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, when we were younger, we had, we had visions and we had like goals and, and, and passions that we wanted to pursue that oftentimes fall by the wayside. Right. So a vision board literally is taking, going through magazines, cutting out phrases and pictures that, that feel good to you or that show you like, this is what I want to do. So it's something that I look at every day. I love that. Um, My sister recently gave me a book called The Five Minute Journal. And this is by far, I think, the best introduction for anyone who's looking to learn how to be mindful or to quiet their mind Mm -hmm. or to set their intentions and goals because it literally is five minutes, if that. You're supposed to write in it in the morning and in the evening, but it doesn't feel like a task and it doesn't feel like a chore because anything that feels like a task or chore, eventually we will stop doing. Right. And it literally asks you just a few questions. So it starts out with um, a quote. So like today's quote, I just opened mine because I'm sitting in my bed. It says, only those who attempt the absurd can achieve the impossible by Albert Einstein. And then it goes on and it has, I am grateful for, and it gives you three lines, three things that you're grateful for. And that could be anything. You could be grateful that you woke up. You were grateful for your health or, you know, that your kids are are well or whatever the case may be. And then it asks, what would make today great? And again, you, you write down three things. And what I love about this is you can almost help influence your day. So if I might say something like, what would make today great would be 15 minutes to myself to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. You've almost set the intention in your head before you've, been, before you've even gotten out of the bed that at some point you're going to try to work in this time to do this for That's yourself. That's awesome. Yeah. Then, and then it asks for a daily affirmation. It says, I am, and then you complete that sentence. And that's all it is in the morning. That's all you have to write. I love those that. Th- those three things. And then the evening you come back and you say three amazing things that happened today. And sometimes it's very easy to find them and sometimes it's more difficult. But what I appreciate about that is that you learn to appreciate and be grateful for even the smallest things. Yeah. Because you can and find then, something. Right. You always, yeah. there's always something to be yeah. grateful for. No matter how bad the day may have seemed, there's always something to be grateful for. And then lastly, it says, how could I have made today even better? Oh, and then that's, that's it. Awesome. So it's, yeah, the five minute journal it is definitely worth it. I suggest everyone pick it up. That is awesome. Um, and so is it long enough to go like a year? Is that, I mean, does that seem to be kind of the length of time. So for it. yeah, so so there's a there's a prelude when you when you first uh, open it that kind of tells you how to use this journal, and you're like, I don't think I need to read this, but it actually was smart to read it because it gives you the whole idea of why you're doing this. Um, but so yeah, I could probably go an entire year through this book, oh, um, and my cool. my goal is really to use it every day. Yeah. In yeah. the beginning, it said start with five days because five days is what you need to help start a habit. Mm -hmm. And from all the research that I have done for mindfulness, it's usually, it's either, people either say 21 days or 40 days to make a, to make it a habit. Oh, that's interesting. So my goal is to go at least up to 40 days straight. And I missed a couple of days. So now I think I'm on day like 10. Oh, that's good So my good, goal though. is to make yeah. it to 40. So, and now I kind of wake up like, ooh, before I get up, let me write. Yeah. And you're and already probably like, you're training your mind to think, or already start thinking about it first thing in the morning. Right. So the first yeah. thing I do when I wake up is like, what am I grateful for? You know, it's a, it's a great way to start your yeah. day. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than the, the stress or the dread of things that. Right. The breakfast. Yeah. Lunch, like making lunches and getting people dressed that. and out the door in time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing about that. I love that. Of course. 
So as you've been in this consulting role and kind of this coaching, teaching role with with women, what has been um, fulfilling for you as a mom? And, um, you know, you were you've you've had a I think a really vibrant career and then, you know, took some time to be with your kids and are now stepping back into kind of career mode. So as you think about how you're personally fulfilled as Zakia, um, and then what's also challenging about doing this work under this kind of con- consulting structure as a mom? So I don't necessarily coach people per se. Mm-hmm. So I definitely want to persuade people yeah. to think about what they're doing, what they're eating, the products that they're using. But I'm not charging anyone for any of my advice because, again, I'm not a medical professional. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a dermatologist. I'm not anyone necessarily that, who has the education behind to say what I'm saying. I yep. have just done the research and I encourage other women to do their own research as well. Yeah. And what's difficult in this space to be considered an influencer are when you have influencers that are just posers. Yeah. So for me, it is very important that if I put something up and, and I've gotten to the point where I do do branded content, um, but I will not endorse a product unless I will personally use it. Yeah. So I've, I've actually turned away some opportunities with products where I was like, the money was nice, but it doesn't fit the brand. So yeah. for me, the biggest thing is to make sure that I am authentic and that I am not just putting this stuff on my Instagram page and then right. going home and eating a big grass fed burger. Right. You know, so mm-hmm. it really is, I, I'm showing you how to do it because I'm actually doing yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So it comes wonderful. from a real place and it comes, there's a certain auth- authenticity that comes with it. Um, What's been harder for me with my children as a mother is I they've gotten so used to me being here and to me mm-hmm. being at their beck and call yeah. that now that I'm sitting and I'm taking calls and I'm consulting more. And a lot of my consultant work is still in the marketing entertainment kind of industry, oh, okay. but I have started to do do that more heavily. And so if I say I actually have a phone call or I'm actually sitting at my computer and I have work to do, they don't understand that because yeah. they're like, wait a minute, it's <laughs> all about us. Yeah. Now you have to do this, like what's going on? So it's balancing it for them and making sure that like, especially, you know, having young girls, I want them to see me working right. and I like that they're seeing me work in a non-traditional form. Yeah. Like I'm not getting up, I'm not leaving. So I'm, I'm grateful for the point that I still am able to spend most of my time with them. Yeah. But when they're in school, I can work and focus. And then hopefully, you know, I can get most of it done during the day when they're in school. So that mm-hmm. when we're home in the afternoon, that I can go back to spending that quality time with them. Yeah. And in some cases, I can't. And I might have the sitter come and do the afternoon activities with them because I can't. Right. And the biggest thing is not to have the mom guilt. Yeah. And I think we're so all hard. guilty <laughs> of mom guilt. Yeah. It, Cuz it it's so hard. easy to just say like, "Oh my gosh, am I not doing enough for them?" because we realize the weight on our shoulders of raising another human. Yes. Right? Yep. And but at the same time, you say like, "But I still have other obligations yeah. that I need to get done and like, who comes first or what can I put on the back burner?" And Oftentimes, we are the people that end up on the back burner, mm-hmm. not our kids and not our work, but we, we, we run ourselves into the ground. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's the, the, the balancing act of figuring out, starting if, you know, if I had to start my day a little earlier or most of the times I do my work after bedtime mm-hmm. because that become, becomes my time. And it used to be I would sit on the couch and just veg out on shows. Yeah. And now I'm actually on the computer working because if I can get some of tomorrow's work done tonight, I can spend more time with them. Yeah, that's wonderful. And it's all seasons, you know, you can't see the end of this season where you're working at night, but it's not going to be like that forever. Um, You know, and as they get older, they'll understand better what you're doing and why you're doing it. And, um, you know, I'm kind of a believer in like, we might not be able to see the end of that season, but they, our, our seasons are always 
shifting and changing and it's not going to be this one way forever and ever and ever. So, I mean, um, absolutely. Yeah. When, when my kids yeah. were young and I was just like, oh my gosh, they're so young and they're babies and they need yeah. me. And now they're at this point where they're kind of independent and yeah. they don't need me as much. So it, it, I mean, it moves quickly. Yeah, it really does. It really does. What's your favorite um, hack as a mom? Like, so for just, you know, managing schedules and needs and personalities and just the kind of life maintenance that everybody requires as you know um from from the mom in the house what what's your favorite way to keep everybody on track or to keep so, yourself on track okay so i have a love hate relationship with the laundry okay <laughs> when it was just me yeah. i used to love to do laundry yeah i thought it was almost therapeutic and then I had these little kids yeah. that produce so much laundry I, that it's, it's like just crazy. I don't daunting. even know how it's possible. <laughs> it drives me crazy, especially up here in the winter because there's uh, so many layers. Yeah. <laughs> I literally need to wash clothes at least like every four or five days oh without gosh. having to have like some massive pile. But my biggest trick for getting it done somewhat efficiently, at least for their clothes, is they now have to make sure that they turn their clothes right side in. Oh, that's good. And it doesn't good. seem like a big thing, but when you have to fold the clothes and before you can start folding, you have to turn everything yes. right side in. It yeah. actually is time consuming. And additionally now they love, because my, my seven-year-old is a neat freak, right? Mm -hmm. Never has anything on her clothes. Very rarely does she have stains. My five-year-old... It's like, oh, we painted today at school and I just painted my whole body. <laughs> and so I have to literally like, you know, pre-stain all of her clothes. Yeah. But I started making my own solution that I'm comfortable with them using themselves. So I put it in a spray bottle and it's oh. right beside their hamper. So now when they turn their clothes right side in, they look, they, they want to find stain so that they can spray their clothes. Yes, that's and it awesome. it literally is... It's equal part, well, not equal part. So it's probably like two tablespoons of, I use Dr. Bronner's soap. Yeah. I don't know if you know yeah. Dr. Bronner's, yep. love Dr. Bronner's. Any, any of the scents are fine. And then I use that with hydrogen peroxide. Okay. So I put probably like maybe a cup and a half of hydrogen peroxide with the soap, shake it up and then leave it there and they spray it. And when I say this will take just about any stain out, it will take anything out. Oh, if it's a bad amazing. stain, yeah. like tomatoes or something like yeah. that, you might want to give it a little scrub. Yeah. But everything comes out. That's awesome. How smart. And to give them the ownership of like, look, you get to spray it and, um, you know, get to have, <clears throat> excuse me, have some ownership of it. That's awesome. Yeah, they, they enjoy it and it makes my, at least cuts down some of my time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, it's funny, I'm, I'm kind of a freak about, like especially during flu season um so mm -hmm. i like making sure that when i wash the clothes they they are right side out and so the way my kids take off their clothes but especially their socks they're always inside out so i spend mm -hmm. so much time flipping everything the right way in order to wash it and i it's never occurred to me to like get them to do it um right which, you make, I feel you make like, a game of it. It's just yeah. something that they have to do. Yeah, I love that. The spray bottle helps them. They're more willing to do it when they know they get to spray their get clothes. Spray and sometimes yeah. they're just spraying their clothes. There's nothing I mean, on I'll it, just give them a spray it. bottle with water and like, right. here, just <laughs> spray your clothes. You turn it in right side out, you get to spray it. Yeah. Um, I, I love that. I love that. So um, as we start to wrap up, what goals do you have for yourself for this year? I love to hear about moms with goals. So is there anything you can share with us that's on your mind? Yes. Yeah, I really, I've been saying it for a few years and I haven't mobilized to get it together, but mm -hmm. I really want to create um, wellness events for busy oh, moms, yeah. busy women, you know, and, but in a reality, like, you know what, everybody doesn't have a weekend to get away. Not yeah. everybody even has a whole day to get away. Yeah. <laughs> and creating these micro wellness events that give women tangible um, and 
like tangible things that they can actually go home and implement into their life yes. with ease. Yes. And um, I'm working with a few other people and influencers to try to make this happen. I would like to get at least two done before the end of the year and then make it a series that just rolls out at least once a month that I am either visiting a local city or a city somewhere across the country and giving women the opportunity to say like, I'll give you two and a half hours, show me what I can go home right now and yeah, do. I love that. Yeah, because I think like, you know, for somebody like in my household, we, you know, we're not necessarily clean all the way around. You know, I try to be mindful of like what I'm putting on their plates and what I'm, um, you know, using as far as b- products um, in the house, but I'm not a hundred percent clean, you know, as far as what we're eating and what we're using. And when I think about making the switch, it feels very overwhelming because it's like, if you almost kind of buy into the, well, it's all or nothing mentality. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. um, I think moms probably feel if they feel anything like I do, it's, it's it's like what some of these questions that I've asked you tonight, it's almost like, where do I even start? And right. um, even this conversation has been so helpful and very practical. So I love that idea. And I think that you would have some great response from, from moms who are, you know, like, send me away with like five things I can go do when I get home. Right now. <laughs> right. right. Right now. And I mean, yeah. it has to be tangible. Like no one has time to like, you know, turn their life upside down. Right. And I think, you know, when people ask me often, like, how do I become vegan or how do I start? I always say start slowly. Yeah. I only know one person who has gone through this is who's been able to go cold turkey and maintain it for the yeah. most part. Yeah. Everyone else kind of needs to like, and even myself, I had to slowly ease into the idea. So instead of, you know, meet seven days a week, why don't you try five days a week? Mm-hmm. And if you could do that for a couple of weeks, why don't you try three days a week? You know, and slowly like change it. Give yourself time to make the adjustment yeah. and training yourself again to think like, okay, I'll have more salads or, you know, I can do a, you know, a veggie pokey bowl. Or mm-hmm. there's just, there's just a, a lot of different ways that I think that you can like give yourself time to adjust and change your lifestyle without going gung ho drastically from like, you know, a 180. Yeah. Yeah. So one last, I love that goal and I can't wait to follow as you, you know, start to pursue this and start to implement this. Um, and one last question, but as we start to wrap up, I think I might've said that about my last question, but this, this will be <laughs> <Okay>. it. <laughs> um, I'm enjoying that. So uh, yeah, fine. me too. Yeah. This is so, it's like, I, I'm just bursting with questions, but, um, so as a woman of color and, you know, I think that a lot of, um, the, the work that you're doing, obviously it applies to all women and really to everyone, but why is it especially important for women of color to be equipped with this knowledge? Um, unfortunately for women of color, we are being diagnosed at the same rate for most Mm of the, most of the same diseases, um, as women, um, as a whole. Yeah. But our death rate is drastically different and higher. Yeah. For a lot of times, pre- preventable diseases, right. heart disease is a major one. Yeah. And that um, women of color, especially black women, are dying from in droves yeah. and young. Yeah. Um, and heart disease, in my study at eCornell, is really definitely related to the food that we're eating. Wow. Almost 90%, I would tell you, it's food consumption. Wow. Um, diabetes, obviously, is strongly mm-hmm. on the food. Um, there is so much evidence to support a plant-based diet for, for diabetics and being able to come off of insulin just by changing their food. Yeah. And, and, and people were actually floored that a high-carb diet could actually work for a diabetic. But that's, that's a totally different story. Mm-hmm. Um, Breast cancer, again, we are still, we are being diagnosed at the same rate, but we are dying from from the disease in much higher, higher rates. Yeah. Uh, a lot of that does have to do with education and right. access to health care yeah. and when we're being diagnosed. Unfortunately, Black women are being diagnosed much later in the process, making mm-hmm. it harder, obviously, to fight it. Um cervical cancer, which this one drives me insane that anyone is dying from cervical cancer because it is so preventable and all it would take is a pap smear. Yep. One pap smear. And now with the pap smear that they have, I was floored to find out 
I was going in for my pap smear and I was probably like a couple months late and I was like, I got to go in. It's been like, you know, 14, 15 yeah. months since I've had one. And my gynecologist was like, actually, the new test is good for five years. And I was like, wait. Oh. Because she was like, wow. you're not due yet. And I was like, no, I am. It's been over a year. Yeah, she was like, no, no, no. Months. The new The new test can go up to five years because now they can detect if you have the cells that cause dysplasia, which ultimately could lead to cervical cancer. Wow. So she's like, a lot of people don't know that. And luckily insurance hasn't caught on to that. And I was like, yeah, I know you say five years, but I'll probably still be back in another year just because you guys like pounded it in our head that we had to go every year to have it done. But even still, you know, there are so many ways to make sure that this is not happening and it's still happening. Yeah. And so, you know, for women of color, I really, I really kind of pride myself to be an advocate for us mm-hmm. because oftentimes I think that there are so many people in the wellness space and it's done so well in so many other cultures and it's not in ours. Yeah. And I really want to get the word out because I, I mean, th- women of color deserve to live a full, healthy life. And to have this knowledge, at yeah. least be told, you know, what you're doing to your body. Yeah. And that, that's my goal. Yeah. Is really to try to change the way we eat, the way we think, and uh, the products that we're using so that we can stay around to really like, you know, women are the pillars of the community, period. Yeah. Absolutely. Especially and, and with women of color. Yeah. Like they really are holding up their community. So yeah. it is important that they stick around and they're healthy and that they can help take care of those that come behind them. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And you're, and the work you're doing is amazing in that space and, you know, in that. And I think that, um, you know, that this kind of education will hopefully be one of the ways, because there are a lot of ways that this needs to happen, but one of the ways we can start to bridge those gaps where, you know, there's there's so many factors that go into, you know, these death rates, but access to health or lack of access to health care at the same, you know, um, is not comparable to, you know, other right. like to, to white women. But mm-hmm. if women of color have this education around what they're eating, then if we can start to reduce the diseases and the, you know, the illnesses preventatively, then that'll help bridge that gap. Um, you know, as we're hopefully as a society also bridging that gap in other ways as well, you know, like with cost and all the, you know, all the other ways that it needs to be, (laughs) um, you know, changed. But I, I would hope that preventative education and changes will, will help. So, um, I think it's great that, you're working to, to start to, you know, give that kind of education to women of color. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, um, this has been so informative and helpful and I I've loved learning from you and can't wait to see what's next for you as you continue to grow this platform. And, um, you're, you're doing a lot of great work for a lot of women and moms. So, um, why don't you tell everybody where to find you online so they can learn more about, um, healthy eating and healthy beauty and mindfulness and um, follow your journey online? Um, so the best place to find me is actually on Instagram um, at Zakia Miller. So it's Z-A-K-K-I-Y-A dot Miller, M-I-L-L-E-R. Um, but you can also go online and at com as well. Perfect. And I'll link all of that in the show notes too, so that um, people can just click right over and and follow you online. And um, thank you again. And I look forward to f- continuing to following your journey. Thank you so much, Melissa. Yeah. This was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Zakia. Thanks for tuning in for another inspiring episode of the Influential Motherhood Podcast. Be sure to follow my own journey in motherhood and work at Melissa Duncan JD on Instagram and follow the behind the scenes of the podcast at Influential Motherhood on Instagram and Facebook. If you're enjoying the Influential Motherhood podcast, please take a second to leave a rating or review in iTunes. It is how you can help other moms find the show so they can be inspired by these stories. See you next week.